What's up? This is Dr. Taylor Crick at the Washington Wellness Center, and today's video is eight ways to control your light exposure for better sleep. So we have another webinar that's like how to sleep better, and, and controlling light exposure is a big part of that. This is just a, a shorter version, so I want to go through these a little bit quicker. If you want to get a background and more uh, strategies to sleep better, go to that other webinar. But controlling your light exposure is the number one most important thing to do for better sleep. And it's also just really important for overall health. So let's just get into it. So, you know, why does your light exposure matter? Um, so circadian rhythms is why your light exposure matters. Your body goes through these rhythms called circadian rhythms. And most of us have have heard of that before. You know, somehow magically our bodies wake up in the morning and they go to sleep at night. And unless you're pretty significantly disrupted, your body just does that on its own and we kind of take that for granted. But these are, are circadian rhythms and your hormones work on a circadian rhythm and a lot of your cellular functions are on a circadian rhythm. The science is now discovering this. In fact, like it says there, the Nobel Prize was won in 2017 for discoveries around these circadian mechanisms because what they're finding is that over a third of your genes in your body, over a third of the genes in your body are controlled by circadian mechanisms, which is crazy. So it's now considered, circadian disruption is now considered a hallmark of cancer. It's uh, linked to metabolic diseases. And there's all kinds of research coming out about circadian rhythms. But you think about it with these rhythms and with, you know, your ancestors and the way our bodies were designed and things like that. This is the way that life has always been for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. There's always been sunlight in the day and darkness at night. Right. And that's just, you know, we take that for granted, but that's normal. That's how our bodies were designed. That's how people have lived up until very, very recently. I think the incandescent bulb was invented in the 1890s. And before that, it was candlelight, it was flame, it was fire, and that was your only existing light source. So that is a very, very new thing that we have light bulbs, we have especially technological devices, of course. But, you know, if you're born in the year 2000, you think like this is the way that life has always been. If you're my dad's age, if you're my grandfather's age, you remember a time where, where things were technologically very, very different. And all the time before that, we did not have these things. So anyway, that is what your body's used to. That is what it's designed for is light in the day, sunlight during the day and darkness at night. Now, today with modern technology, what do we have? Well, we have indoors uh, under fluorescent lights all day long. I mean, even right now I'm recording this video and I've got some lights uh, that we use in here and it's like, this is not natural lighting. And when you look at the infrared or the, um, the, the wavelength spectrum, there's different wavelengths. So white and blue light emit a different wavelength than red or orange light. And you know, what the sun is, is it's full spectrum all the way from ultraviolet to infrared. So ultraviolet you can't see, infrared you can't see, and the full color spectrum in the middle, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. You know, we all know that. My five-year-olds know the color spectrum, but sunlight is full spectrum. The sun emits a full spectrum in the natural balance of the way that our bodies are used to. An incandescent bulb is even full spectrum. That's why they get hot, that's also why they are not very energy efficient is because they emit a full spectrum of light, not just uh, individual wavelength. With now with LEDs, we can kind of uh, change the wavelengths to brighten up a room, but we're not, we're missing out on other wavelengths. We have wavelength imbalances and, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't need to get too far into it. Um, but we're, we're indoors all the time with artificial lights. Um, and then at night, we have light bulbs. We have what's called, in the literature, it's called Allen, artificial light at night. It's light pollution. It's artificial light at night. It's associated with different cancers. It's associated with different metabolic diseases. It's associated with, with sleep disruption, certainly, um, but artificial light at night. But then, not to mention, we have our TVs, we have our phones, we have our tablets, we have night lights, we have all these different things that we do at night and we don't have, you know, pure the darkness of night. So your light exposure controls your circadian rhythms. Your circadian rhythms control cellular mechanisms. 
these cellular mechanisms are going to control whether or not you have normal healthy function or you don't. And if you don't, then you're going to get disease processes and different things. So that's why it's really, really important. Here's just one paper that's really interesting to read. I think you'll find it fascinating, but obviously that's me. Um, but it's called, and the title I think says it all, Nocturnal Light Pollution, Light Pollution at Night, and underexposure to daytime sunlight, saying that those are two problems, and we have them both, so they're complementary, complementary mechanisms of circadian disruption and related diseases. And this paper goes through um, just all the problems with indoor living, then it goes through all the, the research with artificial light at night, there's a ton of citations, it's an editorial, it's a free full text, it's really, really fascinating to read, um, but really, really just interesting. But what can you do? Eight ways to control light exposure for better sleep. Once you understand that background, all these things make sense. So first thing in the morning, getting early morning sunlight is really, really important. That kickstarts the body's circadian rhythms and says, okay, this is day. And then also the early morning sunlight has a few differences in, in wavelengths that are, that are present at that time. Uh, and so the early morning sunlight in many ways is the best thing. And really that's the bottom line is get up as early as you can. Watching the sunrise is ideal, but getting that early morning sunlight into your bare naked eyes is really, really important. Um, glass blocks UV. And that is important. That really, really matters. So bare naked eyes is ideal. Glass would be second best. And number two goes along with that. Ditch the sunglasses. My gosh. Drive around town and just start looking around on a sunny day and count how many people you see not wearing sunglasses. It's rare. And it's a crazy, crazy thing that... I've had people get better sleep by just ditching their sunglasses because then all of a sudden you're getting that daytime light exposure. If you want to know more about that, go back and read this paper about our underexposure to daytime sunlight and how you know we just don't get the same lux brightness that we do from sunlight. So ditch the sunglasses. You know, now I still wear my sunglasses occasionally if I'm out boating, if I'm skiing, if I'm anywhere I want to look cool, which is pretty rare, but like, you know, maybe like a wedding, I got a suit and tie on, I want to like wear my sunglasses, I don't know, that's pretty rare. Um, number three is daylight anchoring, and that is a fancy term for go outside and get some light during the day. It doesn't have to be early morning sunlight, it doesn't have to just be ditch your sunglasses, but go outside and seize every opportunity that you can to get sunlight onto bare tissue. Eyes, especially eyes by far, especially, but you also, the science is now discovering very, very recently that you have melanopsin receptors in your skin. Um, some really cool things about your skin can actually pick up some of these photoreceptor things. Uh, but go out and get sunlight whenever you can, even if it's the middle of winter. You know, inside a window is, is the second best option, but get don't be afraid of the sun for sure. I'm not saying go get sunburned or something, but don't be afraid of the sun in your eyes. Go out and get that. Sun gazing is a pretty uh, popular practice. Don't look right at the sun. It's a bad idea, but look 10 to 15 degrees off and away from the sun. And that's really, really powerful and, and fairly popular these days. Um, use Flux, Night Shift, or other software on your phone or other devices. And I forgot that I was going to have this pulled up beforehand, so I'll show you what that looks like just even here on my computer. Um, Flux is a software that you can use. I, I think I could probably install it on this computer as a Mac, but you can certainly use it on other non-Mac computers. So let's look at this. Let's go to displays. This is on. Uh, this is a Mac, obviously, but you can do this on your phone. You can do this on your iPad. So my night shift is is on right now. You just can't really tell. It looks pretty normal to me, but when I turn it off, whoa, that gets really, really bright. That's almost like blinding bright white and blue light. And white and blue lights are the ones that shut down melatonin the most. Uh, kids are a lot more sensitive to this, uh, or twice as sensitive in some studies. So then I turn that back on and it goes down here. Now I can change that to more warm and hopefully you can see this all during the, the slideshow of how that's changing. Now I keep mine like on at all times. 
Um, but there you go, you can just kind of see that demonstration. But you can use those softwares on your phone. You could see like how that one showed, it can be programmed for a time. So like my phone, I think turns on at uh, you know, six o'clock at night and turns off at seven o'clock in the morning or something like that. It shifts the color scheme to warmer color tones. Uh, number five, wear blue blocking glasses. So same concept. The blues and the whites are, are the bad ones. Blue blocking glasses are starting to get really popular. Here are my daytime ones. They're probably going to reflect these lights because they reflect the blue off of them. So I don't, I don't know, but in this video, I'll probably have like a blue tint on my eyes. But these are my day ones. I used to wear these in the office at my old clinic. Sometimes now I wear them when I'm working on the computer. Uh, but at home, when I walked in, not, not when I walked in, but my kids kind of know that this is what I what I wear at home in my orange, amber, blue blocking glasses. If I'm watching TV, if I'm watching something on the computer, if I'm you know doing something on my phone, um, I wear these blue blocking glasses. They probably cost like ten bucks on Amazon. Um, really inexpensive and really um, well researched thing now, and, and getting to be very very popular blue blocking glasses. Same concept, once you understand the concepts, they all kind of make sense. Boy, when you take those off, it's like blinding. Um, but you can install red or amber light bulbs. Um, they're pretty, I mean, they're easy to find. They're inexpensive. You get them on Amazon as kind of decoration or party bulbs. Um, but we have red bulbs, we have amber bulbs that are a little bit more yellow. They're, they now are making, like there's a Philips, um, Philips light, I forget the name of it. But they're now making these lights because, you know, the scientists are catching on to this for sure. They've, they've known for a long time, actually. But um, they now make lights that you can change the color scheme throughout the day. So you can kind of do like a night shift like we just saw on the computer. You can do that in your house. How stinking cool is that? That's epic. Um, I want those. Um, but you can install the red amber bulbs. That's the, uh, the, the, the cheap version. That's the Taylor Crick version. Um, number seven, you sleep with an eye mask. So you sleep in, in cave-like darkness. You think about no matter where, how far back your lineage you're talking, whether you're talking cavemen or you're talking, you know, 500 years ago, when the candle blew out at night, it was dark, okay? And you could argue, well, there's the moon and there's the stars, but nobody's ever slept without shelter. Um, humans, you know, find some shelter. There are no starlight or moonlight for the most part. You're in pretty dark light, or your ancestors were, and that's how you should be too. Cave-like darkness. I love the fact right now that uh, they go in waves, you know, for sure. But right now, my five-year-olds like won't sleep without their eye masks, and we have uh, we have uh, double-layered blackout curtains in their rooms. All these different things because kids like I said are more sensitive to this and that's well established in the research that kids are more sensitive and I, I've referenced some studies before where they took kids and they shined a light through their closed eyelid and it shut down their melatonin production so sleep with an eye mask an easy solution I love my eye mask and number eight like I just mentioned with my kids black out your room you should be sleeping in cave-like darkness that is, um, you know, e easier said than done for some people. Like, oh, I need a nightlight, or I need to, you know, this, that, and the other. If you have to have those things, like you get up and pee every night and you need a light so you don't stub your toe, then get the eye mask. But otherwise, cave-like darkness for sure. Um, and, and you can measure these things. A lot of these things, you know, you can measure. Like, a great example is like alcohol, like, oh, I need a nightcap to sleep better. Well, actually, when you measure it, you sleep worse. Um, so that's that couldn't be further from the truth, but sometimes we think that we need things. Oh, I need a nightlight. Oh, I need a, a this, or my kids need a nightlight. Like, no, they don't. You know, they, they, just, they just don't. They don't need a, a nightlight. They might be more comfortable with one, but they absolutely don't need one, and it actually might be doing more harm than it's doing good. So understanding these principles gives you some action steps to take, but there are eight things you can try to control your light exposure. Now, you do those one day, Maybe you're gonna sleep better. I, I doubt it. It's probably a you know, coin toss, or, and I guess you're not. But you do those consistently. 
You do those day in and day out. You do those week in and week out and you continue doing them and all of a sudden your sleep improves. So I talk about in our other webinar about how my deep sleep has gone from about 12 to 15 minutes a night to about an hour a night by taking some of these action steps because I measure it with my, my sleep ring here, my aura ring. But anyway, there's some action steps. Try that. I challenge you, but don't try it for a night. Try it for at least a week. Try it for at least a month would even be better and see if you're not starting to get better more deep more restful more sound sleep that's leading to more energy and clarity throughout the day